The following is brought to you by GFL Ag. Next thing you know, you know the next thing. Next is Now is a short podcast discussing agriculture's emerging next-gen tech and trends as they're happening in our industry. Next is Now, presented by GFL Ag. Listen where you get your podcasts today. Good day and welcome to Wheat Pete's Word here on Real Agriculture for Wednesday, March the 27th on this episode of The Word. Off-farm education. Wow, that has stimulated a lot of discussion. Wow, yields. Finally know what they are here in Ontario. And then we're going to talk about phosphorus, phosphorus, and more phosphorus. Just a great discussion that I wanted to have for a while. It is time. Let's go. Yes. So off-farm education, Wyatt sent me a tweet and really interesting scenario. He inherited a farm, 200 acres. He's 25 years old, zero ag experience. And he asked me if it was worthwhile for him to attend Ridgetown Campus University of Guelph. And of course, everybody is saying, oh, Pete's going to say yes, because that's who Pete is. But it's such a great thought process. So if you have kids coming up, young adults that are going to come back to the farm, I cannot stress how critical it is to get them off the farm they grew up on for at least a year or two. And whether they go to the local co-op to work, they go to work for another farmer, or they go to Ridgetown Campus or University of Guelph or Olds College or, or somewhere, they really need to, to expand their horizons and see how other people do things. Now, I really like the further education because in Johnson's mind, farming is the art of applying the science. Johnson's a scientist. I'm not the greatest artist, so I'm not the best farmer in the world, but by golly, I understand the scientific principles. And if you understand the science, then as an artist, you can apply those scientific principles and you can become the best farmer in your area. If you don't understand the science, it's just harder to be that, that best artist, if you would. And the other thing is, in terms of of having different ideas of how to do things. Everybody has their own way of doing things. We are creatures of habit. When you go to a meeting, you sit in a chair. You go out for break, you come back, you sit in the same chair. We've always, whatever, high-speed disc. We've always deep ripped. We've always moldboard plowed. So we just keep doing those things. You really need to get your kids off the farm. Send them west. Like, it was really interesting. The Twitter discussion, a, a whole bunch of people said, man, I wish when I was young I'd have gone west, joined a harvest crew, and just seen the country and seen how different farmers do things. Johnson someday would love to join a harvest crew because <laughs> I think, but get them off the farm. Enough on that. Uh, Lindsay will probably, uh, Sh Sean Haney and I had a great discussion about this on Real Ag Radio, so you can listen to it, and Lindsay will link the, that particular discussion in the post, but man, uh, I just make it happen. Hey, Agricor has finally gotten their corn numbers finalized here for the province of Ontario, and dang it. Aaron wins on the corn front. Wheat Pete still wins on the soybean front, but Aaron had the over on 200 bushel per acre average yields. The final agri-corn number at 202. That's a two bushel per acre better than 2021 when we set the last record at 200 bushels per acre. And man, back in December, we were at 198.5, and I thought I had Aaron on both soybeans and corn soybeans by the way at 53 and i'm going to blame it all on my good friend warren out there at morrisburg he said he had record corn yields just awesome and he was late finishing harvest so it's all you late finishing harvest people with big yields warren i'm blaming you for i now owe aaron uh, a lunch somewhere he owes me lunch for the for the soybeans but nonetheless 202 and if you look at the numbers the county numbers oxford county 222 bushels per acre average yield. I, I don't think I've ever seen anything like that. And then you look at Kent County, they're next at 218. 
But the other really interesting thing in those numbers, Temiskaming District is the lowest, but there's enough corn growers in Temiskaming District that AgriCorn now reports that. And if you go back five years or 10 years, no way there was enough corn growing up there to, to get an AgriCorn report. Their average yield at 141 bushels per acre. Rainy River at 146 bushels per acre. Doesn't sound like much to a grower maybe in Chatham-Kent, but when you think about how far north they are and that they're just starting to grow corn and they're pushing 150 bushel per acre average, means the best growers are probably at least getting close to 200 bushels per acre. That is incredible. On the soybean front, yes, an average yield of 53, 60 bushels per acre in Kent. They were the winner, 59 in Oxford. But again, go north, Temiskaming, 37. Ah, that's not so exciting, but a, a short season area for sure and able to grow soybeans. But Rainy River was next lowest at 49. So Rainy River, basically 50 bushel per acre soybeans. Wowzers, that, that is quite, quite incredible. Hey, one other uh, real quick note. Grain storage, an excellent article coming out of Minnesota by Ken Hellevang. And what really astounded me in his article is that spring solar radiation on the side of a bin to heat the grain up on the, on the south side where that sun is heating, spring solar radiation is two times, twice as much as summer solar radiation. And I haven't got my brain around why that is, whether it's just the angle or, or because the days are getting longer, we get to the summertime and things are all just warmer. I'm not 100% sure, but twice as much solar radiation. It has been warm in Western Canada, uh, not, not really currently, but uh, the U.S. Northwest, uh, or pardon me, the U.S. Corn Belt, it's been warmer than normal through those regions. Just check your corn in storage. What's really cool in Ken's article is that for every t uh, 10 degrees Fahrenheit, so that's about 5.5 degrees Celsius, for every 10 degrees Fahrenheit that the temperature of the grain goes up, the length of storage of that grain drops by almost 50%. So as an example, if you have 17% corn in the bin, and I know everybody's saying, well, wait a minute, Peter, it's 15%. Yeah, you can get some hot spots. You get that moisture migration where we get those warm temperatures on the bin. It can get to 17 pretty quickly if you're not paying attention. It's 130 day storage at 50 Fahrenheit or 10 Celsius. It goes to just 75 days at 60 Fahrenheit, which is about 15.5 Celsius. And then it goes to 45 days. So we've gone from 130 days to 45 days storage when we get to 70 degrees Fahrenheit, which is, which is 21 Celsius. So you just go like, wow, that is like really incredible. Stay on top of it. Keep the aeration fans running. It's a bit early for that, probably in Ontario, but it's a great heads up, an excellent article there by Ken Hellebank. Okay, I want to move on, and I want to spend the rest of the time talking about phosphorus. And what stimulated this? I have had some questions. I actually missed them last, last episode. But we did the agronomists. Uh, it was Wheat Pete and Lyle Cowell from Nutrien. And the focus was on starters on Monday night. And again, I'm sure Lindsay will link this in the post. If you get a chance, watch that. But it was so many questions in the chat. Like we've never, I, well, I shouldn't say never, but, but just questions upon questions. And it drives home the point that we need to talk about starters and, and getting the starter story straight. So that's what we're going to do from here on in. First off, I want to talk about seed bed utilization, this concept of seed bed utilization. Everybody in Western Canada says, really, you're starting there because they all know about it. But here, once we get into eastern Canada, into the, the humid climates, the wet climates, we don't even know what seedbed utilization is. And so what seedbed utilization is, is really the spread in the seed trench. A disc drill has very minor spread, right? It's probably half an inch wide. And so if you're half an inch wide on 30 inch centers and you concentrate all that phosphorus in that zone, Man, it's a lot hotter than as if I go out to Western Canada with a hoe drill and I use a three-inch point 
that spreads the seed and fertilizer out over that three inches or that two inches. And so now if it's three inches on 10 inch centers, that's 30% seed bed utilization. Whereas if I'm at a half an inch on 30 inch centers, I'm at under 2% seed bed utilization. So in terms of toxicity, of the starter fertilizer from a salt content, uh, concentration, man, it makes a big difference on seed bed utilization. So for example, Jason asking, what's the maximum safe rate of phosphorus on wheat, barley, and oats? Well, man, it depends on seed bed utilization. It also depends on what crop are you growing. So wheat, tremendous phosphorus demand, one of the most responsive crops to phosphorus. I said that on the agronomist and immediately get pushback that canola is just as responsive. And, and actually, for the forage growers listening, alfalfa is incredibly responsive as well. But because of the, the makeup of the wheat plant or the corn plant and the growing point being protected, by the coleoptile and not pushing up through the soil, we can put a lot more starter phosphorus on with wheat, barley, oats, corn than we can when we go to canola or sun, soybeans or alfalfa. So you really, you, well, if you're putting it right with the seed, man, you have to keep those rates really low as soon as we m move to most of the broadleaf crops, the legumes and the broadleaf crops. Typically, we cannot put on nearly as much starter fertilizer. And moisture matters because it's salt concentration. Dilution is the solution. And if you have lots of moisture, is why we get away with higher rates in eastern Canada, because we have higher moisture. It just dilutes that salt faster. And it also depends on the soil type because the soil type, a clay soil, holds a lot more moisture than a sand. So when you look at those maximum safe rates, typically with wheat, barley, and oats, we would say uh, 50 pounds of phosphorus, like 100 pounds of MAP is fine. But I know some growers that, you know, if you get in a sandy soil, really dry climates, even that might be pushing it. And again, what's your seed bed utilization? So the next really interesting question that, and again, Jason asked this question because they are strip tilling in Manitoba for corn and they're putting the fertilizer down with the strip till unit. And we've had this discussion in Ontario as well. But what is the ideal placement for phosphorus? And it really is right with the seed if you can get it right with the seed because then the roots hit it as soon as the plant germinates. But you need to keep it below the seed in general terms because for most crops, that's where the first roots will come out is below the seed, but not very far away from the seed. In corn, we talk about a two by two band. Oftentimes it's two inches over and maybe only one inch below the seed. And Jason's comment was that strip till in, in Manitoba, they're going six to eight inches deep with that strip till unit and putting that fertilizer, you know, he thought six to eight inches deep. Man, that is, that's just hiding the phosphorus from the plant. And so you think about that in a perfect world. And apparently, the, again, my good friend Warren, this is his system, in a perfect world, you would put a little bit of phosphorus right with the seed. You would put a two by two band beside the seed or perhaps a mid row band. Although if you're getting five inches away with a mid row band on a 10 inch drill in Western Canada, it takes a long time for the roots to get there. And you may not get the impact of that phosphorus fertilizer as quickly as we would like to see. Uh, generally speaking, we'd like it closer than that. It's just, it's just that early demand of the crop is really, really high. And later in the season, it's still got the demand. But if you starve the crop for phosphorus in the early going, particularly on grass crops, you, you just never can catch up. It will delay the maturity of the crop. And it, it's just so keep it as close to the seed as you absolutely can without getting into those those salt concentration issues. And if you're strip tilling, we, we, the perfect spot in a strip till would be kind of in that zone. You're gonna plant the corn two inches deep. So I want that phosphorus about two to three inches deep and not much deeper than that if I can help it and not too much above the seed. Really hard to do in a strip till situation. But as, 
is that I think in the chat again, the discussion was, man, you take that $10 muffler pipe, if you put too much down that $10 muffler pipe and you plant the seed into that zone, then again, we've got that salt concentration is issue. So how well is it blended becomes a really big question also. The other thing that was talked about that, and, and lots of discussion about this, but availability. And we're getting lots of products out there. The solubility of crystal green, it's less water soluble. And so that means it, it doesn't tie up as quickly with the calcium and the iron and the aluminum in the soil. Well, that's true. Uh, also, we talked about triple superphosphate. I had this question from Matthew. It's more available. Well, with triple superphosphate, it lowers the pH more than MAP does. So MAP lowers the pH to 4. Triple superphosphate can lower the pH uh, down to maybe even 2. So it, it really does have more acidifying capability on high pH soils that will keep your phosphorus more available in the short term. But there's such an excellent paper from uh, Dan Kaiser at University of Minnesota. Again, we'll link it in the post. All of these are the science, right? Johnson's a science guy. All of these are the science. But when you actually put it in the soil, the reactions aren't enough different. And we see that the crop response is almost always exactly the same. And there was one discussion on Twitter about uh, a top FOSS versus MAP comparison. And there was a 21 bushel advantage to the top FOSS. The data is the data. But at the end of the day, we almost never see a 21 bushel response to, to phosphorus versus no phosphorus. And so you just got to say, wait a minute, something else going on there. Let's investigate a little bit further and not just assume that that's the difference in those two products because it, it just, that is very unusual and, and not often very repeatable. And we need repeat, repeatability before we start using higher priced products that provide less phosphorus, man. They gotta consistently provide more yield before we're gonna move there. So keep doing the plots. That was the other, the other big learning, or not big learning, but big discussion. Keep doing the phosphorus plots to sort it out on your own farm. Then there's lots of questions that came in around biological products, and we didn't get to them at all on the the episode of the agronomist so michael saying okay is growth promoting bacteria help phosphorus uptake well if if the bacteria actually do help root growth any additional root growth will pick up more phosphorus but remember that bacteria themselves are not what brings the phosphorus to the root that's a fungal thing so bacteria probably don't do much there from a fungal standpoint i mentioned that you know corn following canola particularly in western canada can be a real problem because canola does not support the fung fungi the mycorrhiza in the soil that help the plant pick up phosphorus corn needs that fungal population to help it pick up phosphorus and jason's saying oh yeah they had a disaster planting corn after canola in manitoba here in ontario we rarely see that because mostly after after the canola we grow a cover crop like oats highly mycorrhizal and so that mycorrhiza gets re-established in the soil but in terms of the biology in the soil even if i add fungal fungal uh, inoculants to the seed well do they replace or outcompete the fungi that are already in the soil and this is the big challenge with biological inoculants we know that they can work but almost never do they bring enough more phosphorus to the seed then it would it would just you would be better off to spend that five or that ten dollars on additional uh, phosphorus fertilizer, map fertilizer that you put down rather than the biological. Janet making the comment that if you apply a lot of phosphorus, that the biology gets lazy and so then they don't work for you. And that may well be true. But man, at the end of the day, on almost all of the trials we've done with that concept, 
the biology will do more for you if you don't apply the phosphorus, but your yield will go down. And so this whole concept of phosphorus as a starter fertilizer is incredibly important. And that is the main nutrient with corn. Don't forget the potash. I don't have time this episode to talk about micronutrients in starters. I will do that next week. And with that, I am out of time. That's it. That's all on behalf of the team here at Real Agriculture. This is Wheat Pete with the word for Wednesday, the 27th of March. Keep the questions coming. We'll get back to some of those next week. But yeah, phosphorus matters for high yield crops. Full stop. Talk to you next week.